Ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Jesse Webb and I have the privilege of being um, the National Managing Partner of Spark Helmore. Um, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to welcome you to our office and to support uh, the McKell Institute, um, a public policy institute dedicated to um, the development uh, of practical policy ideas and contributing to public debate. Um, I firmly believe organisations like the McKell Institute have a, a fairly important and vital role to play um, in shaping public policy here in Australia. I'm very pleased that the Honourable Andrew Constance, uh, MP, Minister for Ageing and Minister for Disability Services and Member for Bega is here today. And I thank the Minister for taking time out of his very hectic schedule to, uh, to be here with us today and to speak uh, to us about the Government's vision for ageing and disability services and what the National Disability Insurance Scheme means for New South Wales. Um, Minister, I'm looking very forward to hearing your address on, on the government's vision, as I'm sure everyone else in this room is also. Um, I'd also like to welcome um, the Honourable John Watkins, uh, Chair of the McKell Institute and former Deputy Premier of New South Wales, um, the Honourable uh, Sandra Norrie, a former New South Wales Minister, and Peter Bentley, uh, the Executive Director of the McKell Institute. Um, to give you uh, a little background on Spark Helmore, we're a, we're a law firm of 600 people operating out of eight offices across Australia, um, serving the needs of clients in insurance, government, uh, financial services, <coughs> mining, construction and property sectors. Um, and our expertise spans from you know, commercial to construction, uh, workplace to insurance, structuring to superannuation, mining to manufacturing, and property to procurement. This year, we are very, very proud to be celebrating our 130th anniversary. Um, so on that note, I'd, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, attending the lunch today. Uh, thank you to the Minister. We uh, certainly look forward to um, hearing your presentation and look, we also look forward to continuing to support the Kell Institute in its endeavours. Um, and on that note, I'm going to hand you over to the Honourable uh, Mr John Watkins. Well, thanks very much, uh, Jesse. It's, uh, it's great to be here and thank you very much to you and, and for your f firm's hospitality. Um, and welcome to everyone indeed. There's people here from a wide range of uh, companies, uh, for-profit, not-for-profit, uh, different agencies. Um, so we really value your loyal support and your interest uh, in the McKell Institute. In particular, Minister, uh, thank you for your time. Um, Sandra Nori, uh, she was telling me earlier, is the only person in New South Wales that, uh, in Australia that ever represented uh, McKell, uh, the seat of McKell, for a very brief sh period of time uh, when the seat of Sydney uh, was, was uh, renamed McKell. Who, and McKell obviously is the, the man that uh, we revere. Um, I want to also mention the fact that Reverend Harry Herbert is with us today from Uniting Care. Uh, Harry, as you know, is a very distinguished uh, citizen of this state, indeed Australia, and has worked like few others for the um, support of people uh, in need. Um, Harry, it's always lovely to see you. Thank you for attending. Um, the McKell Institute's mission is to enliven debate around the city uh, in this place, in, in uh, New South Wales. Um, we believe we have started to do that since we launched earlier this year. We've released a really good paper on housing affordability with some really creative ideas about how we can make living in Sydney more affordable for those people who do live here and their children. Um, we're about to release a paper on uh, productivity and how we can improve, increase the productivity in our economy. And we do other things. We released earlier this year an index about uh, people's satisfaction with New South Wales and living in New South Wales. We take our mission from Bill McKell, Premier of New South Wales and, and Governor General of Australia. Uh, Bill McKell was a practical, compassionate, thoughtful man. Um, who thought that ideas and debate were important. And they are, like no other time probably, well thought out ideas that are appropriately debated 
with tolerance towards others is what all of us here in this room surely would, uh, would want. And that's what we hope to do um, at the McKell Institute. We're really honoured and pleased that Andrew could join us today. Andrew was elected to the New South Wales Parliament in 2003 for the seat of Bega down the south coast, beautiful part of New South Wales. Um, Andrew became the shadow minister for ageing and disability services in 2007 and he held that role until uh, the government's election, Barry O'Farrell's election in 2011 and then went into the Ministry of Ageing and Disability Services. And I think because of that background that he had and the contacts that he made throughout the industry uh, and community, he's proven to be an outstanding uh, minister. Um, and I know a bit about him because I'm, I'm also the CEO of Alzheimer's Australia in New South Wales. And our job is to advocate and care for those people in New South Wales that have uh, different forms of dementia. It's about 90,000 citizens of this state with dementia. That will double in the next 15 to 20 years. And Andrew has a particular, he's got a portfolio responsibility for dementia, but a, but a commitment to it. He's been very much a friend and supporter of our office in Bega for a number of years. He's played a significant role in, in that, the rollout of the NDIS, and it's really great that uh, a trial site um, is here in New South Wales, and I don't think that would have happened with that, Andrew. Um, he's a humane and compassionate man. Um, now, it's difficult times for governments across Australia, state and federal, because of you know, reducing um, taxes in particular for a state government, um, as we know. Um, and when you look at what really bears down on a state budget, as we know, it's, you know, it's health, it's education, it's disability services. Um, Andrew's played a significant role in advocating for the maintenance of funding in disability services, and for that, I think all of us that care about our wider community are eternally grateful. Um, Andrew, you really do us proud by being with us today, um, and uh, I'm very thankful that you've come. Um, I'd like to introduce Sir Andrew Constance. Well, thank you, John, and, and thank you for those incredibly warm words. And uh, can I uh, say that it's a real privilege to be with you all here this afternoon. In life, we all want to be loved. We all want to have established relationships, and we all want to be able to participate within our local community. Yet to have disability in modern day Australia all too often means that your fundamental human rights are not there. What we as a country are seeking to do through the National Disability Insurance Scheme is address those fundamental shortcomings as it relates to the human rights of people with disability in Australia. It is a fundamental human rights issue. It's not an economic issue, it's not a social issue. But to think to have disability in this country at this time all too often means that you are discriminated against. It wouldn't matter if it's in the community, it wouldn't matter if it's in the workplace. For too long, people with disabilities have been told what supports and services they're to have, by whom they're to be delivered, and when they're to be delivered. In fact, our state-run disability support systems are based on rationing as opposed to entitlement. All too often, it's not until you either require disability or have a loved one born with disability that you soon realise that those disability supports, which the wider community think are there, <laughs> just simply aren't. And when the Productivity Commission was engaged to undertake this assessment, they described the state-run systems as underfunded, fragmented, and not meeting the true needs of our community. We all live in a state in which 1,500 people with disabilities still reside in archaic 1950s, 1960s institutions. 
We live in a state in which there's 2,500 people under the age of 65 living in nursing home care. There's a further 600 odd who are living in boarding houses without the necessary supports. And we have an enormous challenge with the ageing of the community where ageing parent carers just simply do not have the capacity any longer to be able to provide that 24-7 care role. Whilst the 24-7 love role will never stop, that compassion, that undying commitment to support their loved one, we are all too often seeing from a government perspective heart-wrenching decisions being made to relinquish responsibility of a loved one to the state. In fact, last year alone, 76 families in New South Wales went through that heart-wrenching decision. So the backdrop to which this public policy debate around an NDIS is incredibly raw. Too often families are in crisis, unable to get the respite support that they need to be able to take a break. Too often the day program to which a person with disabilities enters and the placement required is not often there. We live in a state in which there's 200 people with severe and profound disability, yet the state system is only supporting 55,000 people. From the O'Farrell government's perspective, we are committed to working with the Gillard government to make this a reality. And the reasons are truly come back to that need for the fundamental human rights of people with disabilities to be addressed in this country. It's shameful, yet it's hidden away. We have people living in social isolation. And it wasn't until the recent COAG, where the first time, for the first time in living memory, that disability supports was on the front page of every national newspaper and in every media outlet for well over a week. I uh, see this reform, as I said, through the prism of human rights because it is about the ability of an individual with disability to be able to pick and choose the supports and services that they want on a daily basis instead of being dictated to by a bureaucrat, by a politician, by a service provider. And that's what ultimately the reforms in disability services are about. At a state level we've already embarked on a reform which is about moving away from the block funding of service providers to one in which the funding is attached to an individual. The individual is assessed, a individualised plan is devised and the individualised funding dollar is attached. Now that's a far more equitable way to go than what we have currently where uh, the government largely through non-government organisations, but also as a service provider itself, sets budgets tied to programs in the hope, and in the hope, that outcomes are achieved. And it comes at a time, of course, when we all know that the resource allocation through the states has simply not been there. If there's one person that I pay tribute to in terms of improving disability services markedly in this state, it's John Della Bosca. He devised as minister a 10 year disability services plan called Stronger Together. In the first five years, $1.3 billion was allocated. And when the O'Farrell government was elected, we moved to allocate a further $2 billion in growth monies to form part of the second five years of the plan. But what's most important in relation to the plan is that we are putting the individual at the heart of the decision making. So we're starting to run initiatives which are designed to build greater capacity within people's lives to be able to start to make those decisions and ultimately take responsibility for those decisions. And I'm fair dinkum when I say that the current support system does discriminate and does put up barriers which deny people their fundamental human rights when it comes to decision making. We have to ensure that through, uh, through the rollout of the National Disability Insurance Scheme and the state-based reforms that we're doing, 
under the guise of a person-centred approach, that the individual is involved in the development of the scheme and in the development of ultimately the, the outcomes to which they're seeking to achieve. This is about ensuring the life aspirations of people with disabilities, their carers and their families are met. It's not a public policy that is owned by any political party or owned by any tier of government. This has to be owned by people with disabilities for it to work. What we've seen uh, certainly over the course of the last 18 months is very strong engagement between the states and the Commonwealth when it comes to devising the building blocks of a national disability insurance scheme. What we witnessed recently was the unedifying politics of COAG delivering the argy-bargy of the political leadership in this country debating funding formulas. We can't lose sight of what this ultimately is about. And key to it is making sure that certainly as we move to the national rollout of the scheme, as we move to the commencement and launch of the site in the Hunter, that individuals with disability are engaged in the process. And likewise, their carers and their local supports. It's a complex reform. It's not easy because there's a whole raft of building blocks which are currently being developed uh, to in underpin, in essence, the scheme. But at its heart is the, the move to individualised service packages where the individual is in control and has that choice. Issues around eligibility, the national assessment tool, uh, issues to do with local area coordination, capacity within individuals, capacity within uh, the service system, are some of the great challenges that have to be resolved within the next 10 months. And they're not easy. And as part of that, we in New South Wales are in a terrific position because the state-based reforms which have already been commenced dovetail nicely into what needs to be achieved when it comes to the NDIS. I have to be honest with you all, I'm very concerned about the time frame because if you consider uh, certainly in the first instance that people with disabilities for all of their lives have largely been dictated to about their supports, they're now going to be thrust into a position where they ultimately get to make the decisions. So instead of going to a day program through a local NGO, which has been the traditional uh, support way of doing things, individuals for the first time might opt to go into the wider community and engage in other activities, be it going to a local fishing club, be it going to a local arts group, be it in any other uh, recreational or employment-based pursuit uh, that they desire. Having that capacity is, is a, and being in a position to have that capacity with supports around you uh, is a real challenge. Uh, in New South Wales, we're rolling out a model called Ability Links, which is about providing 248 local area coordinators uh, to be able to link people into those supports that they want to attain within their local community. But also as part of that, uh, those local area coordinators will be charged with the responsibility of building greater capacity within the community. Going along to those local groups and seeing what needs to be done to ensure that those barriers of discrimination against people with disability are removed being able to assist uh, people who haven't had any dealings with disability, be able to provide the supports um, within their local community structure. <coughs> the Commonwealth, through the, the launch site pr proposal uh, in the Hunter, had allocated some $66 million towards developing that local area coordination model. And it is ultimately going to underpin uh, the framework uh, when it comes to an NDIS. The Hunter-based uh, launch site is incredibly important. Uh, we in New South Wales, I believe, only have, well, we're the only ones who have a, a fully fledged launch site where you can start to properly test uh, the mechanics behind what is a no-fault social insurance model. 
The Productivity Commission recommended uh, trial sites in the order, order of 10,000 people. Well, New South Wales is the only jurisdiction to have a launch site of 10,000 people. Uh, Victoria has 5,000. Uh, South Australia, Tasmania and the ACT uh, have moved to age-based cohorts in, some, in a couple of those jurisdictions. Uh, but we will have the ability to fully test the NDIS. As part of it, uh, and as part of the launch site, uh, 6,800 existing clients will move into the scheme. Uh, a further 3,200 new clients will also, uh, for the first time, uh, engage with the disability support system uh, to be able to have their needs met within the community. The argy-bargy around COAG a number of months ago uh, very much centred on money. And we are going to see another COAG meeting in December where the national rollout will be discussed and the full funding of the scheme uh, high on the agenda. Can I say this? Can I say this to the political leadership right across the country, regardless of a state premier or a prime minister? Don't lose sight about this reform. Ultimately, this is about supporting tens of thousands of people with disability across our community who are crying out for the proper level of funding and the appropriate supports being available in their local community. I wish we could avoid the unedifying politics at play around COAG because it's not achieving the public policy outcome that we need in this regard. I'd also uh, obviously to the Commonwealth say that this is also, I believe in many ways, needs to be encapsulate, encapsulated in the broader issues around tax reform. The reason that the NDIS has come about in a public policy sense is because the states just simply cannot fund the level of unmet need across our community. And in order to ensure that the scheme is successful and we're not back in 10 years' time uh, dealing with an unsustainable model, we have to recognise that the Commonwealth are the only ones who have the revenue base and the capacity to be able to properly fund uh, the scheme. From a New South Wales perspective, we're absolutely committed to putting our existing monies and our growth monies into the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Absolutely committed to doing that. But it's key that also the Commonwealth are recognised that the only way, the only way that this public policy can work uh, is through it being underwritten through the income tax base of the country. If you consider that fiscal drag is expected to be $22 billion in the years 2018, well, there's one potential means. I also believe that the wider community is happy to accept a debate around a levy, a new tax, because I know that the wider community will be very happy to know that uh, their hard-earned tax dollars are going into providing the supports of people with disability across our community. Now, whether it's done through an increase in the Medicare levy or done in any other form, that very much rests with the Commonwealth. But if there is an issue around the revenue base capacity to meet this from the Commonwealth, well then, for goodness sake, have the debate because it's one worth having. I know that uh, certainly uh, from a state, base, state perspective, uh, we, cannot, we do not have the capacity into the future. Yes, we've been able to commit $2 billion of growth monies at a time where, uh, certainly in terms of the state, there are some enormous financial challenges, particularly as it relates to a drop off in our GST receipts. We have been able to obviously safeguard this funding and the main reason for doing so is because by investing $2 billion, we're saving hundreds of millions of dollars in high cost crisis driven supports. And therein lies the premise of the NDIS. By investing early and investing in a preventative way, you reduce higher costs per unit in terms of disability supports as they relate to crisis and certainly as they relate to need when people are not getting the supports when they should. I'll be particularly keen to see the outcomes uh, of the South Australia trial because they're going to test an NDIS as it relates to zero to seven year old uh, to our children. And there are enormous complexities as that relates to uh, certainly uh, families who for the first time 
receive a diagnosis of disability uh, with their baby, to how they engage with what is currently a maze of system entry points, a maze of services, and all too often, uh, certainly, um, there is a need for greater understanding, particularly amongst the medical profession, as to where people should turn when a diagnosis is given. So that, that trial is going to be fundamentally important. But the reason I raise it is because by investing early, particularly in some fields such as autism, by investing those dollars earlier, uh, you know that from a taxpayer's perspective, funding is saved down the track. We have generations of uh, older Australians with autism who did not get that early intervention. And the social outcomes are profound, but also the costs of providing uh, those supports uh, is very, very significant and could have been avoided. The NDIS uh, debate um, is an interesting one, also insofar as the Productivity Commission is concerned. Uh, we are, uh, as a state government, uh, very much sold to the full recommendations of the Productivity Commission report, and we endorse, uh, endorse that report. Um, I do note the comments from Lindsay Tanner today uh, in relation to the Productivity Commission and the NDIS. Can I say that Lindsay Tanner is wrong? Bill Shorten and the Federal Government were right to refer this through the, to the Productivity Commission. In particular, knowing that the Commissioner who undertook the inquiry, John Walsh, is a, a person with disability himself. He knows the system. So Lindsay Tanner was wrong in that regard. It was the right place for uh, the referral to be made in terms of getting the econometrics right behind the scheme, but also looking very closely at the governance arrangements which I might add, New South Wales, uh, as it relates to the, the launch site, is in full agreement uh, with the Commonwealth. But also, and, and most importantly, uh, you know, as I said before, having, uh, having this scheme underwritten by the Commonwealth and having a sole funder is also key uh, to ensuring uh, the scheme's success. The Hunter Base trial uh, will commence in a very quick time frame. And we at the moment are battling with a whole raft of issues. In fact, there's a two-day workshop on currently involving New South Wales and Commonwealth officials to discuss a whole raft of complexities uh, as it relates to uh, the industrial aspects of the scheme, because we're going to see state-based employees referred uh, to uh, the transition agency and ultimately the National Disability Insurance Agency but also some real issues as they relate to the capacity of people with disabilities, the ca capacity of the service providers uh, themselves, and also, of course, the structures that need to be set up to, to deliver it. I, I do worry about the time frame. I think it's going to be very, very hard to meet. Uh, I, I am concerned that uh, all of those aspects uh, that do require um, decisions to be made around uh, you know, we are going to struggle to meet that one July time frame. Uh, the Commonwealth officials um, are working to it, we're working to it, and hopefully we'll get there. But, um, you know, being upfront and honest, um, I think the first thing that should be done as it relates to any uh, scheme change or model change when it relates to people with disabilities is to actually have full engagement uh, with people with disabilities themselves so that you have that, that broad-based understanding as to what their needs are and uh, the outcomes that are to be achieved. The Hunter Base trial um, is a scheme which is involving $585 million of state-based monies and $300 million uh, from the Commonwealth. Uh, I would have liked to have seen that funding split reversed, to be honest, um, because certainly from our perspective, um, we do not want to see a precedent set in relation to the Hunter Base trial, which has uh, national rollout implications. Very pleasingly, the Commonwealth, uh, through our negotiations, and this is an area that hasn't been fully recognised, 100% of the risk, both in terms of uh, transition risk, pricing risk, population risk, uh, rests, with, uh, rests with the Commonwealth. 
I'm very pleased about that, particularly considering uh, that uh, we're also going to see psychological illness, mental health, and those who have permanent disability associated with their mental illness actually come into the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Also, um, as part of the, the Hunter Base launch site, I think it's, it's pivotal and, and key that we also work out uh, certainly the delineations between the National Injury Insurance Scheme, which is due to commence in the year 2015, and of course the NDIS. And again, more work uh, needs to be done uh, in, this, in this regard. I am expecting a lot of people to move into Newcastle in the next, next nine months. Um, but it does pose some very significant challenges for us as a state government. Uh, for instance, uh, there's going to be 200 positions sought from allied health professionals, uh, case managers to move into the transition agency. Now what I'm very happy for is obviously those locally based uh, case managers and allied health professionals to be doing so, but I do not want to see a position where all of a sudden the central coast or the mid-north coast becomes short of professionals to support uh, vulnerable people within those communities as, as the trial uh, potentially soaks up that workforce. There is some enormous challenges in that regard as it relates, uh, as it relates to, to transition. Beyond, uh, beyond uh, the scheme development, of course, is the politics of COAG, which I've alluded to. Um, in the lead up to the December meeting, uh, you know, we certainly are doing our homework at the moment in terms of uh, the number of people who will be involved in the scheme across the state. We, of course, still await uh, is you know, issues around eligibility being finalised by the Commonwealth. There is a concern across the community as to who's in, who's out, who's in that tier three category as it relates to uh, eligibility. Uh, we're expecting, uh, as a result of the implementation of the scheme, some 95,000 people from New South Wales to enter the NDIS, and a further 95,000 people who will need to be supported on an ongoing basis who won't necessarily fit into the NDIS as well. So this would suggest that the state is still ultimately going to, to have significant responsibilities as it relates to the provision of supports to people with uh, disability across our community. These transformations in policy will transform lives. Uh, there is no doubt that uh, uh, we're going to see some significant change, but as part of it, it also means not only the support side of things as it relates to people with disability be transformed, but also the wider community engagement uh, with people with disability. Because employment also fits into this. Uh, social pursuits more broadly across the community also fits into what we're talking about. There's no doubt that uh, certainly uh, more needs to be done as it relates to the employment of people with disabilities in our community and within government. I know that uh, you know, we can initiate some incentives as we've done at a state level, but I've been very concerned when I initiate an incentive to business to take on a person with disability, such as payroll tax relief, and yet the uptake uh, of that benefit, for whatever reason, and I suspect uh, there's not enough uh, work being done from within New South Wales government agencies to promote uh, these opportunities for business, uh, means that that uptake has not been as quick as I would have, li would have liked. Uh, one of the great benefits that I think we will see out of the NDIS and the state-based reforms is that we are going to see the wider community start to engage with disability in a way that they never have in this country be it through the workplace, be it through social pursuits. It means that everyone across the community uh, will become and start to become engaged in providing a stronger and safer and better place when it comes to, uh, comes to providing disability supports. I do not want to live in a country where every indicator as it relates to other nations around the earth uh, shows that Australia is not where it should be in providing supports to, uh, to vulnerable people in our community. Uh, we need to do far better. We're a far more compassionate community than what we are and it's ultimately key uh, that uh, with this reform uh, not only do governments get it right but the whole of community uh, gets behind it. And I'm very excited uh, about the, the challenges that, that lie ahead in, in this regard. Uh, John, thank you for having me today. Um, 
I know, and, uh, and Jesse also, thank you for having, having me today. Um, I'm happy to take questions uh, for half an hour or so, but uh, can I particularly uh, thank you for the opportunity to address the McKell Institute today. Thanks, John. John. <laughs> Can you tell me? Sorry, John. Sure. Thank you. Thanks for your uh, explanation. It's for what determines whether someone's in or out? I mean, and you've said that a large number of people in the Hunter will come into it. Um, and But the, the New South Wales government will still retain the necessity to support a whole raft of other mm. people that aren't in the NDSI scheme. What, what's the determining factor? Yeah, according, in some ways this is still being resolved. And this is again part of the, the frustration. There's been a number of committees set up uh, to look at a raft of the building blocks around the scheme. One of those committees is eligibility. Uh, and very pleasingly from New South Wales perspective, Graham Innes as the Human Rights Commissioner is sitting on that, that committee. The, um, the Productivity Commission identified uh, tier three and tier two uh, as it relates to a broad brush of people with disability who would fall into uh, the NDIS and those with lower support needs would be in the, the tier two. But again, we're, we're just, we're operating in the dark in, in this regard and we're still obviously awaiting the outcome and the determination in that regard from Jenny Macklin as to who's in, who's out. Uh, and I'm very conscious that uh, across the community there is that undertone where people are saying, well, I, I mightn't even fall into the scheme. So we need clarity, we need it, need it quick. But either way, uh, what I'm saying to you is that the state is still going to have a responsibility to, to be providing supports uh, to, to people with less need. And that's where I think, and quite excitingly, that the reforms that we're embarking on in terms of providing people that choice and control through the uh, person-centred approach uh, will enable them to, to reach their life aspirations. So, in short, uh, get back to me in a couple of weeks or a month or two and hopefully we'll have greater clarity. But um, to that end, um, ultimately, uh, we are looking at, you know, a raft of, of disability um, which, in terms of the cohorts, which will fall into the scheme. Minister Dermot Roach from uh, from Medibank. Um, so in our business, we've got a, I guess, a, a problem in the sense of an aging population and a significant rise in chronic disease. Um, and one of the things that we've been doing for the last couple of years is trying to move away from some of the more traditional face-to-face -face interventions mm. to um, the provision of interventions via phone, online, and video. And we're seeing some really good outcomes, and good take-ups, um, by using new technology. As part of the NDIS and as part of the trial, are you going to consider um, new technologies and means of providing services, doing large scale assessments and so on and so forth, and where relevant, you know, providing video consultations and so on? Yeah. Um, great question, considering yesterday I was in Pambula Hospital down on the far south coast where they can't get a doctor overnight from 10 till 6 o'clock in the morning, and uh, there was a proposal to use telehealth uh, when people enter the ED for triage purposes before determining whether someone should be uh, transported. Um, Look, it's the way of the future, and certainly when it relates to an NDIS, it's, it's got to be front and centre in terms of some of the thinking. Um, there's no doubt that uh, we see across the disability field at the moment a, a real lack and drive in the use of technology. We're starting to see applications and software st starting to, to happen. There's some green shoots there, but um, I, I think, and you know, I think more broadly that. Uh, you know, there is a, an enormous digital divide for people with disabilities and if you actually look at not only access but ultimately how technology can assist people, we haven't thought outside the square yet. So uh, in terms of your, your question, absolutely. Um, I think the, um, certainly in terms of um, the use of telehealth and, and its application more broadly uh, in an NDIS setting is something which needs to be explored. Uh, and, you know, certainly I think if we can get the fundamentals right of the scheme, um, it will start to give that, give that capacity. Particularly as it relates for people who live in regional and remote areas, it's, it's going to have to be uh, 
uh, front and centre. I mean, I, I can't tell you the number of complaints that I'm getting from mums in isolated communities who have a child with autism and yet the, the tyranny of distance in a country setting needs to be broken down through uh, the use of, uh, use of technology. Um, and I think certainly because people will have greater capacity through their individualised service packages, what you will see is people making that determination that they want to access that service being provided by, by a provider which has the, the, uh, you know, the, the digital enhancement available to, to be able to better uh, meet their re daily requirements. So uh, it'll be driven by the consumer. I mean, that's the other aspect to this. I and mean, we are, in, besides me talking about it being largely through a human rights prism, there is a market at play here. There will be a, a competitive tension that will exist amongst service providers to do better. And uh, obviously the use of technology will be one of those key components. Hello, uh, my name is Satyana, I'm from Horizon Healthcare Solutions. Um, for the past two years I have I've been working for Department of Aging and Disability for seven years in the past in various departments, I know the situations. Uh, one thing major issues with uh, aging and disability is uh, patient transport issue, which has been challenging. And, uh, Tell me about it. And I yeah. think that was the all about which is always missing yep. in most of the policy development. And uh, our organization has made my MRT, my, my medical response team, two years we are running as a trial project. It's been successful and we are also giving a cancer patient treatment free transport for their dialysis and, and various uh, mm. treatment which they need. Anything is thought about in that direction, especially these kind of people who are disabled need quite constant treatment and specialist approach or day surgery. Carers are really stressed out, and uh, we are still currently providing a free service with our paramedics. So anything in the future? Well, look uh, again. This is the great thing about the NDIS, and again, further argument to to why it needs to be, um, you know, underwritten by the Commonwealth. Um, you know, if I was to go out and, and again talk to the disability community, one of the fundamental issues that comes up every time is transport. Uh, what we're talking about, because uh, we have seen some program-based packaging and obviously that, that um, block funding of programs to which I refer, which is going to change, one of the key things which will come about is that people will be able to spend their, their funding how they see fit. So, if, you know, and, and obviously it gets monitored over the life course as people's needs and wants change. I had a... Uh, a young fellow with uh, autism said to me the other day, oh, Dad drives me to you know, AFL on a Saturday out in Penrith and he's living at Hornsby and he said to me, well, what's going to happen when Dad can't drive me anymore? So the, you know, the, the great thing about the individualised service package is that it, it needs to be totally portable and it needs to, you know, we don't put in place those restrictions. That said, one of the difficulties and the challenges around this is to make sure that other areas of government don't start slashing their budgets knowing that it could be potentially soaked up in the NDIS world. So health and education, accommodation, housing, transport still must meet their needs, still must meet their requirements in terms of the needs of people with disability. Uh, so we have to set in place means to be able to manage that. Um, I know certainly with uh, the the assumptions behind uh, the client costings as they relate to uh, uh, to the NDIS, that we we will be factoring in transport as, as part of those those costings because uh, you know at the moment there is a very serious lack of transport infrastructure. Community transport is in essence become you know a, a, has been too geared and too focused towards transporting seniors to health facilities, which is fine, but it's the, the ramification of that is that people with disabilities haven't been able to gain access to go and un undertake other community-based pursuits. So I'm hopeful that with those costings being put into the assumptions behind the per client cost, uh, that we can start to see far better outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Minister Harry Herbert from United Care. You, you made a reference to the fact that there were uh, still 600 people living in licensed boarding houses. Actually, I think it's a bit lower than that now, and it'll be lower still. It'll be lower, lower still, still after an instance of that, yeah. Closing, yeah. Which, which is all good. And I can remember when it was, you know, two and a half thousand. So that's all good. And I think your legislation that you've got, which I hope will go through the parliament shortly, is uh, well intentioned and, and, and good. And I mean, you're going to give uh, boarding house residents the rights that Deidre Grusevan promised when she was a minister in the parliament, when she was a minister in the Labor government. So there you go, a historic moment. But I know you're getting a bit of pressure from the property owners about the uh, definition of what a person with a, with a disability is. I just encourage you, I suppose, to, to, to be sure that we don't end up with a very loose definition and then we'll have people with disabilities, you know, in the general boarding house sector, yeah. and again, quite, quite vulnerable. So I suppose uh, my question is, are you going to stick firm about uh, your legislation? Yeah. yeah, we've had, um, for everyone's benefit, we've had a draft exposure bill out in the community over the winter recess of Parliament to consult in relation to reform of the state's boarding houses. Um, I've got to say, as Minister, I've seen some absolutely disgraceful uh, circumstances in which uh, vulnerable people in the licensed sector have been exposed, and yet we still don't know what's going on in terms of the unlicensed, uh, unlicensed sector. Um, the carriage of the bill is um, an interesting one because it's ultimately ended up in my laps, but it, it's also, of course, got Office of Fair Trading and Local Government uh, ramifications. Um, I think the, the key to it, uh, from our perspective, is that you know, you're right to identify that the Property Owners Association have arced up, but uh, I'm not too too engaged with that because they're making claims which are just simply wrong uh, as it relates to the implications of the bill. And quite frankly, um, you know, if a business is getting land tax relief, then as far as I'm concerned, if they've got responsibility for vulnerable people in our community, then the ability of my agency and other agencies to be engaged to make sure that, that people are living in clean, safe environments is, is fundamental. Um, what we are struggling with at the moment um, is that, uh, you know, what, how do you define a vulnerable person under the bill because not every person with disability is vulnerable in a boarding house setting in this state, yet we need a means to be able to, to in essence, identify, identify those individuals. So in the licensed sector, uh, what will be known as Tier 2 in the, in the legislation, um, there's no issue with that. Um, you know, I, I think the, the key to it is um, how, do you, how do you identify it? Um, I don't think if you just loosely describe it as anybody who's on a disability support pension that you, you necessarily and accurately be able to capture, capture the, the, the individuals that we're talking about. And, you know, some of the stuff is shocking, as you know, and what you're hearing is, is probably accurate in relation to the, the boarding house that... I've taken a decision to, with my agency head, to, to uh, no further uh, licence. But it, it, it's uh, it's a major major problem. So, you know, I again, we, we're just working through it at the moment, um, and I'm, you know, keen for this to be introduced in a matter of weeks, um, which will be good news for for everyone. And look, it's not particularly onerous. I mean, we're requiring boarding houses to register, um, which will allow inspections to happen. And in the licensed, current license section, uh, in the current license sector, uh, we're also, of course, uh, strengthening powers of entry, uh, strengthening the provisions in terms of advocates uh, to be able to better assist uh, people with disability and, and mental illness who live in these settings. Uh, but look, ultimately, We've got to strike a balance, and that's between, of course, the ongoing viability of the sector, who do provide uh, affordable housing for people across our community, and making sure that uh, uh, those who are in environments which they shouldn't be, um, you know, allow us to, to get in and support them. Sorry. Minister, um, my name is Richard Barnett. I'm on the board with my colleagues here of the Australian Network on Disability. In my day job, I manage a very large 
uh, supplier of temporary labour, so uh, a recruitment organisation. The New South Wales government is about to uh, reissue its supply agreement for all temporary labour across all categories of uh, skill for the whole of New South Wales government. It's, it's due at the end of this year. I'm wondering whether you would be able to or whether you think it's a good idea through that reissuing process to put in place initiatives to encourage better participation of people with disability on a temporary and contingent basis throughout the government because the government hires thousands and thousands of people a year um, in those part-time or, or, or temporary roles. Um, whether you have any thoughts about ideas that could be done to make that more attractive? Well, if I said no to you, I'd be referred to the Human Rights Commission. So, um, on, on, you know, absolutely. Um, there's no doubt that um, uh, certainly in terms of um, the challenge as it relates to uh, employment opportunities, particularly when it comes to uh, uh, government and government contracts, that um, we have seen a great difficulty in reaching the 4,000 procurement officers across the state and making sure that they are aware of, um, aware of uh, the requirement as it relates to uh, disability. Uh, the Ready, Willing and Able program has uh, generated some three and a half million dollars of uh, uh, contractual benefits to, um, uh, to services, but you know there's a long way to go. Um, so I'm happy, absolutely happy to, to, to go and pursue uh, Greg Pearce in that regard uh, in relation to it and uh, if you can speak to me afterwards. Or Yeah, yeah. Process, yep, yeah. yeah. No, Jim. Jim Moore's very keen. Absolutely. Thank you. That's right. Sorry, there's two two hands up. Okay, first of all, um, there are some very clear definitions under legislation which, um, which governs um, the issues around uh, intellectual disability versus physical disability. Um, you know, it's, it's always been a debate within the community in terms of, you know, where the priorities uh, should go in that regard. But, from my perspective as a minister, it's about supporting people on an individual basis, regardless of their disability, and making sure that their life aspirations can be met. So that's the great advantage of moving away from these block-funded programs to one in which the funding is attached to the individual. Uh, in terms of employment, uh, last year I introduced legislation to the parliament in relation to payroll tax relief to any employer who takes on a person with disability through the state government's transition to work. Uh, program we see about 500 people each year um, work through that two-year two-year program, and um, you know, look. Ultimately, there's enormous social benefit for the individual to be realised by being able to participate in a workplace as opposed to being stuck in a day program. Um, you know, we we, in essence, by putting someone through a transition to work program, the cost is around thirty-six thousand um, dollars. If that person uh, and, and then that person goes on to a, a workplace. Uh, if you were to actually look at the costings of providing uh, this, the day program for that individual over, the, over their, what could be their work life, you're looking at about 1.1 million. So from a social perspective, there's the absolute benefit, not only for the individual, but for also the workplace and other employees to be working with someone with disability. But of course, also from the taxpayer's perspective, 36,000 versus 1.1 million, I know where I want to be. Uh, and uh, to that end, it's, uh, you know, obviously we're very, very keen. And that's why we, we announced the payroll tax relief. And while we're urging business to employ people with disabilities and take up that $4,000 payroll tax benefit. Yep. Right. Question. Thank you. Sure. Um, 
firstly, it's Suzanne Cobb from the Australian Network on Disability, and I have to give an absolute shameless plug that if you're uh, an employer in an organisation who want to see progress in this area, then um, you can do no better thing than joining the Australian Network on Disability because that's about employers coming together to find uh, solutions. But what I've learnt in my 12 years in uh, working with many major businesses and governments across Australia is that employers recruit for skills. And so it's really important that kids with disability uh, get the same educational opportunities and uh, have the same skill development program and um, do the best they can from an education perspective. But I must say, I feel absolutely distressed that um, the uh, state governments, and I'm sure New South Wales isn't a state that's, uh, that's not making this commitment, but across Australia, state governments are not committing to make school buses accessible by 2044. So, you know, I mean, I don't know of any buses that have a 32-year life, but if we can't in Australia agree that school buses won't be accessible by 2044, whereas every bus in the UK, every bus in London is accessible, where are we going wrong with that? Um, Suzanne, thank you for that, that statement. Uh, there's no doubt, um, it's not only about the mode of transport, but it's also the transport infrastructure around it. Uh, if you consider that 25% of bus stops in this city um, meet uh, disability access requirements and the remaining 75% don't, uh, we've got a lot of work to do in terms of how we integrate and work within uh, local government. I notice that Kerry Bartlett's here as the CEO of Wesrock. I mean, these are some very big challenges uh, in relation to it. And they, they are major impediments for people with disability. I mean, the fact that you can't access your local bus stop can have major ramifications for your integration in, in, into the community. Uh, so certainly in terms of the work that Gladys Berejiklian is doing in terms of uh, access, um, you know, we are getting on with the program around train station access. Uh, bus stops are an area which I think we've got to see a lot more work done. Uh, there is a, a national requirement as it relates to transportation which uh, all state jurisdictions have signed up to, uh, but ultimately we, we have to see see these outcomes. And if, if we want the NDIS to be the success, we've got to look to these types of barriers across our community. A bus stop could be a simple uh, form of barrier to, to you know, literally hundreds of people in a, a local area being able to get out and about. And of course, it, you know, it's not only people with disabilities, it's of course it's our seniors community and we all know where that's going given the fact that, you know, in New South Wales there's currently a million over the age of 65 and in uh, 20 years time it's going to be one and a half million and by 2050 it'll be well over two million. So uh, we as a community have to holistically, and this is why we've developed a whole of government ageing strategy, we, we've really got to look at how uh, government services across the board are, are working together because for too long the silo based mentality has meant that uh, those agencies who haven't prioritised in these areas have, uh, have let the wider community down. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you Minister. Well, thank you very much, Minister, and um, we hope that lunch will come out. This is the challenge at these events, and particularly when there's so much interest that uh, uh, the guest of honour often doesn't get a chance to get a bite to eat. But uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And, and I think, uh, as John remarked earlier, that we've got a broad cross-section within this room from the not-for-profit and uh, from business and other organisations. But I think, having heard from the Minister both in his address but also those questions there, there uh, is no doubt whatsoever the challenges that he faces in, in his two portfolios, ageing and disability services, and, and both um, uh, such important portfolio areas, but at the end of the day require more and more support and more and more funding. And um, Minister, can I say, um, I think all of us as, as New South Wales residents are well placed that uh, you're, you're at the helm of uh, both of these important portfolio areas. and. Uh, particularly ageing, but particularly disability services now. And um, uh, we look forward to um, both the Hunter trial side and, and uh, the continued rollout of the NDIS. And uh, very thankful and grateful that you're at the helm of that. Please uh, join me in thanking the Minister again. Thank you.